Check, check. There, good to see you all. Uh, kids, you're dismissed to your Sunday school classes. And uh, if you have a copy of God's Word, you can open it up to the Gospel of Luke with me. We'll be in Luke chapter 9. And if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, you can grab a copy. There's Bibles underneath the chairs all around the room, and Luke chapter 9 is on page 886 in those Bibles. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word. Thank You for speaking clearly to humanity in giving us this book. And so we pray that You would do what You love to do, which is transform us open our eyes to see your glory in Jesus, and give us hope and conviction and transformation and comfort in Jesus. Amen. Well, this is our final Sunday in our series. Jesus has something to say about that. Um, Next week, we'll begin a new series in the book of James, so I encourage you to read ahead. Read through the whole book of James. It doesn't take that long, sometime this week. And pray for our church family as we begin that new series. So in our current series, we're looking at stories where Jesus confronts or corrects certain people. We're seeing that in the Gospel of Luke, how Jesus addresses issues directly in order to change people's perspectives and lives. So by listening to how Jesus corrects or challenges or confronts something or people, we want to let ourselves be corrected by Him. We've seen how Jesus has had something to say about religion, about doubt, thankfulness, and about true greatness. And this morning, we see that Jesus has something to say about self-fulfillment. This is Luke 9, verses 23 through 27. Let's read this together. And He said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Well, one of our core values in modern Western cultures is self-fulfillment. We hear this in phrases like, you do you, or be true to yourself, or follow your heart. Some have summarized this with the term expressive individualism. So the idea that our goal in life is to discover individually our unique sense of self and then express it, perform it for other people to see. We find happiness by following and expressing our heart. We find fulfillment by getting a sense of what our deep desires are and then living them out. And so self-assertion is one of our culture's great values right now. And self-denial is the one thing that someone should never do. They should not deny themselves, nor should they teach someone else to deny themselves. Anyone who would keep you from bravely living out your desires is seen as oppressive. So self-fulfillment, not self-denial, is the modern path to happiness and meaning. This morning, we're looking at this text that we just read where Jesus has something to say about that. So in Luke 9, Jesus defines the very essence of what it means to follow Him. And as He defines this, it's a direct contrast to a view of happiness through self-fulfillment. So He gives us a different path to finding true happiness and fulfillment. We find ourselves, according to Jesus, not by following our hearts, not by following the crowds, but by following Him. So Jesus calls us to deny ourselves in order to find ourselves. He calls us to follow Him, not for the sake of losing life, but truly finding it. We see three aspects of this way of finding true life. 
the cost, the gain, and the alternative. So the cost is what you lose. The gain is what you find. And the alternative is how this is countercultural in every culture, but certainly today. So let's consider each of these as we walk through Jesus' words here. So first is the cost. This section in Luke's gospel is all about giving clarity. Jesus had just previously clarified his identity as the Christ, the Messiah, the King. He also clarified his mission. He is now speaking clearly to his disciples that he will suffer and die and rise. And now he is clarifying what it means to follow him. And he calls any would-be Christian to three things. So if you want to become a Christian, maybe you're here and you are considering what it would mean to begin following Jesus as a Christian, then this is the pathway. Maybe you think you're a Christian, but this, as we read it, doesn't quite map on to what you have in mind for being a Christian. Then this This will clarify or confirm whether or not you are actually following Jesus. If you want to help someone become a Christian and make disciples, as we're called to do, this is what we share with them. So here they all are in verse 23. The three realities are self-denial, cross-bearing, and following Jesus. So first is self-denial. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Now, here's what that does not mean. Denying yourself, and I, I'm drawing attention to this, by the way, because I've heard a number of stories over the years of people who di- did not follow Jesus or were turned off by Jesus, not because they understood him correctly, but because they misunderstood him. They misunderstood what he was asking. So, what does he not mean? Well, denying yourself is not denying your humanity, it's not denying that you are a human being with real physical and emotional needs. This is also not denying your personality. Following Christ isn't about putting to death your God-given personality and just be kind, of, kind of becoming a monochromatic image of everyone else. It's actually changing in such a way that the best of your personality can come alive and flourish. This is also not denying your real desire for happiness. Jesus is not calling people to trade happiness for being a Christian. Instead, this is the path of true happiness, mapped out by the one who made us for happiness. So what does self-denial mean? Denial is about dissociating yourself from something, right? So Peter would later deny Jesus, putting distance between himself and Jesus, dissociating himself from Jesus. So self-denial What's self-denial then? Well, it's about dissociating yourself from your own self in a sense, and in this sense in particular. It's about dissociating yourself from yourself as the ruler of your life. This is about renouncing yourself as your ultimate master and Lord. It's saying to yourself, you're not in charge anymore. So one author put it this way, self-denial is not so much giving up chocolates at Lent as it is giving up on ourselves as lords. It is the decision to let another lord rule one's life. So think of it like Smeagol in Lord of the Rings when he tried to break from his alternate personality, Gollum. He finally had a moment of clarity and freedom. He was tired of being ruled and controlled by this own hateful version of himself And so he asserted that he was not in charge anymore. He said that Frodo, the one he'd follow now, would be his master. Or you can think of it like this. Self-denial is selfishness denial. It's renouncing your own self-centeredness. It's renouncing yourself, capital S, as the ruler of your life. It's transferring your allegiance from yourself to Jesus. This is very different, of course, than our modern culture's pursuit of self-fulfillment. Our culture says you need to discover yourself and live it out. Jesus says you need to discover yourself and then deny yourself. How do we do this? Well, you actually do have to discover yourself and understand yourself, but you do this in order to find the desires that tend to control you. So you do it to find out your controlling 
interests and desires, the ones that really drive you and make you do what you do in life, what's really moving you along, so that, not so that you can live them out and express them, but to see how they often enslave you. So when we look inside, as, as our culture is telling us to do now, look inside and find yourself, if we take an honest look at ourselves, we realize that not all desires are actually good in there. Not all desires are good for us or anyone else around us. And there are even good desires that then we let rule ourselves instead of the Lord Jesus, and it becomes an enslaving, terrible master. So what is it deep down that drives you? What makes you feel happy and alive? What are you really after in life? Is it comfort or being successful in your career or as a parent or in school? Is it the approval and acceptance of others? Is it finding or maintaining financial security? Is it control and power over others? Those, some of those things can be good, but when they control you, you're living on, ultimately only for your own self. Another way to say this is that we're to find our idols and deny them rulership of our lives. So that's the first aspect, self-denial. The second is cross-bearing. Jesus says, if you want to follow him, if you want to come after him, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Now, we hear that and we instantly think of Jesus on the cross. But when he said this, he actually had not yet gone to the cross, yet they would have known exactly what he meant. Because the cross was at that time the worst instrument of execution in the Roman Empire. Crucifixion was for slaves and insurrectionists. They were lifted up on a cross, often naked, publicly mocked and shamed, and then their dead bodies were thrown away. Those who were condemned often had to take up their cross, the cross beam, and carry it to the place of execution. Jesus is saying, I want you to see that as a picture of what it means to follow me. You have to take up your cross and carry it on your way to execution. That, how surprising. He's saying, go pick up the lethal injection kit and bring it with you. Go get your electric chair, drag it into the room and plug it in and then sit in it before we get this done. Bring the bullets and pass them out to your firing squad. That, that's what, would have, that's what he, he was intending to mean there. That's what they, they should have heard. Strong language. The idea is that we're to be violent with our selfishness. We are to kill our self-centeredness. It's about daily, he says do this daily, daily killing our desires that keep exerting themselves to rule over us and rule us rather than being ruled by God and living a life of others-oriented love. The Apostle Paul picked up on this language as he talked about how to deal with our own sin. So here's a few ways he put it in the letter to the Galatians. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. So he views becoming a Christian as this initial crucifixion with Christ. And he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I love this phrase, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, this self-centeredness with its passions and desires. Galatians 6.14, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Third aspect of discipleship is following Jesus, clearly stated. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. One thing that struck me this week is how personal this is, which is really what makes this good news. He says, follow me. Notice he didn't say, follow my teaching, he, although it includes that. He didn't say, follow a podcast. He didn't say, follow these social media accounts. He calls us to follow him, Jesus himself. This is personal. It's really what makes this life of discipleship desirable and worth it because we're not just denying ourselves. We're replacing ourselves as a master of ourselves with Jesus. 
And you can hear that even in the way Paul talked in those verses, right? He says that he has been crucified with Christ, and the way he refers to Jesus is the one who loved me and gave himself for me. He was crucified for me, and so now I crucify what's in me for him. This is the Christian life. It's not just plugging into habits and programs and religious practices. It's learning from Jesus himself, the risen Christ, to become like him. That's following him. He's the one who came to rescue us. He came to our self-centered world to die for us. He bore all our sins on himself so we can be forgiven and set free from our enslavement to sin. So he's not coming to a world and kind of sorting out those who are already good at this and those who aren't and saying, if you're really good at self-denial and putting the Lord first, follow me. No, he's coming to people, all of us who are programmed and hardwired to follow our own desires instead of him. He's coming to people who are bad at following him. And he's calling them to follow him with grace. And then he's going all the way to the cross to die for us. That's real Christianity. A Christian is not simply someone who prayed a prayer one day. It's someone who follows Jesus. So Jesus is boiling down the essence of what it means to follow him here. So if someone thinks that he or she is a Christian, this is how you can know. Are you renouncing yourself as your own Lord and Savior? Are you taking up your cross daily? Are you following him? Because Jesus said, if anyone wants to come after me, let him do these things. So this is what it means to be a Christian according to Jesus. Another way of saying this is how he put it elsewhere, repent and believe the gospel. Those aren't two different messages. We turn from our selfishness in repentance and we trust Jesus as our savior and our leader, which is following him and we do this daily. So you lose yourself as your Savior and Lord. That's what you lose. But what do, what do you gain? What's the gain? What do you find? That's the second part. And it's verses 24 to 27. Jesus is making an argument here. He's reasoning with us. He's explaining why it's worth it to follow him with this kind of all-in commitment. In short, you gain Jesus and you find your truest self. Let's look at his argument. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Jesus is asking us to consider which path leads to a better life, better gain. One path leads to gaining the whole world, but you forfeit yourself. You end up forfeiting your life in the end. The other path is that you deny yourself, you take up your cross daily and you follow him. And on this path, he says, you gain yourself, you gain your life. So do you see here that Jesus is not saying we ultimately lose life and lose ourselves and lose gain if we follow him. Self-denial is not about losing ourselves. It's about losing our self-centeredness in order to gain real life, eternal life, living forever with Jesus, and a life of true joy and fullness. It's about losing our selfishness to gain real life. So Jesus is not just saying, lose your life. He's saying, lose your life to gain true life. And then he gives a warning in verse 26, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed. That's referring to himself when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. So if we follow Jesus He's saying you will experience shame in the world. We may not be well-liked. We may be rejected. We may be not, not able to pursue a certain vocation. We may not be able to keep a certain job if we can't go along with values that would cause us to compromise our commitment to Jesus. We'll experience shame. And Jesus says here, everyone's going to experience shame. It's just a matter of when. You either experience shame now as you follow Jesus as people reject you as they did him, or you try to gain the world in whatever corner of the world you want, whatever joys would make you happy apart from him, and then you stand before Jesus when he comes. So you either embrace the shame that comes with following Jesus now, and you get honor in his kingdom later, or you'll stand before him in judgment and be eternally shamed. So Jesus appeals to all of us to consider not only the cost, but the gain of following him. You you lose yourself as your own master, but you gain Jesus, and you gain 
eternal life with Him. Now, third, what's the alternative? How does this relate to our culture's deep value of self-fulfillment? Well, in our culture, self-fulfillment and expressive individualism, self-assertion is a core value. The heroes in our culture, the heroes in the kids' movies, they are those who feel unique and live it out loudly. Self-denial is the one thing that they certainly shouldn't do. Our motto is not deny yourself, but be true to yourself. And there's a Christianized version of this as well. We, it views Jesus as a life coach who cheers us on as we discover what we think will make us happy, and then we do whatever it takes to fulfill that. Even if this means you discover that a different spouse would make you happier. So you leave your family for a new life for someone else. And the assumption is that Jesus wants you to be happy. And the other assumption is that you find your happiness by following your heart. And everyone else should say, what courage, how brave of you. And that happens story after story after story in our culture. And some people are writing all sorts of blogs and having podcasts and writing books to say that Jesus supports that. You find what makes you happy and Jesus cheers you on. And all these backward people who can't get on with the times need to just shut up. So, what we need to see is that while Jesus does challenge us, challenge these things, uh, there is also something good yet misguided here. So, for example, the pursuit of happiness is good. We do all want to be happy. God made us for happiness, so that longing is good, but it's misdirected when we seek to find it in ourselves. It's also good to not be enslaved to other people's opinions. So many of the motivators leading this self-fulfillment movement get that right. They try to set people free from the enslaving power of other people's approval or disapproval being enslaved to what other people think. So they say, stop worrying so much about what other people think. You just do you. You love yourself. Be proud of yourself. Look yourself in the mirror and say, I love you. But trading the approval of others for self-approval will not work either because you and I both know that we are fickle and self-hatred is real and we are really not impressed with ourselves often. And we can turn on ourselves. And this focus feeds the self-centeredness that's in our, in our hearts. It leads to people who value love and justice, but they can't actually sustain the pursuit of those things with costly self-sacrifice, which is what it takes. And so when a marriage gets hard and doesn't make them happy, they leave. And sometimes they're viewed as a hero for that, leaving brokenness in their wake, though. They don't embrace self-denial that can sustain long-term love and sacrifice and protection of the vulnerable. So Jesus is inviting us to find ourselves in true life and eternal life by following Him. He's saying to us, the more you follow your own self-centeredness, the less fulfilled you'll actually be, and you will lose your life forever anyways, because judgment is coming. In fact, the more you follow your selfishness, we could also say this, just reflecting on this text and this principle more deeply, we can say that the more that you follow your selfishness, the less yourself, meaning the less of the best parts of yourself, you'll actually become. The more you'll become a distorted version of your truest self that the Lord designed for you. But the more you follow Jesus, the more you become like Him. And that doesn't mean you become less like yourself. You actually become more like your truest self. The best parts of you get to flourish in your unique, your unique personality that the Lord gave you. It flourishes with virtue. This is at the heart of C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. It's a fiction work. It's not about marriage divorce. It's exploring that there's this gap that widens between those who are self-oriented, which is how we all come default, and those who open themselves up with humble trust to Jesus. The whole book is about how if you try to save your life, you'll eventually lose yourself. You will become like your worst, most selfish tendency. Resisting Jesus 
and focusing on our own selves is ultimately against our own joy. So we're all seeking happiness, but if you reject Jesus, you're rejecting your only true pathway to real joy and your flourishing now and forever. So every one of us has something that we're tempted to cling to for joy, not realizing that real joy is found in giving it up through self-denial and following Jesus instead. So in this book, The Great Divorce, Lewis moves through character after character, showing that their self-centered commitments may even look fine and not like a big deal right now and even noble at, at the beginning. But if you just follow that trajectory long enough, you see that their self-centered commitment leads them away from Jesus and away from their ultimate joy, the very joy they're seeking. So for one character, it's pride. For another, their controlling desire is the desire for revenge. Or for another, it's the satisfaction that comes from sharing gossip and hearing gossip about others. For others, it may be gaining the respect of others and being respectful in the eye of friends or other cultural elites. Or maybe it's finding self-respect. Or maybe it's sensuality and lust. And Lewis shows in every case, we're clinging to some desire that becomes a deal breaker for us, that we, we really cannot give this up to follow Jesus. It's one thing too far. We can't let it go because we think that will make us happy. And we refuse to let it go and open up to Jesus with humble trust. And Lewis shows that that tendency, if you follow the trajectory forever of whatever it is we're clinging to, rather than letting it go for Jesus, that will consume us in the end. So if you give yourself to your sexual lusts, you will become enslaved to it. You'll become small, and, it, and those lusts will rule and dominate you. He gives an example of people who tend to bicker and quarrel all the time, and how they start moving apart from one another, and they move until they're infinitely further away in their own gray world in isolation and loneliness. Another example is a man who tends to blame shift all the time, focusing on the flaws of everyone else except himself. I mean, we see these tendencies in us, don't we? So what happens if you let that keep going and you keep clinging to that and you don't renounce it for Jesus' sake? Well, in this example, there's a picture of this man forever isolated, pacing around back and forth, back and forth, saying something like, it was all David's fault. It was all Susan's fault. It was the fault of the country. It was fault of this group over there. Like that all the time, never stopping for a moment, looking exhausted and kind of tired, but he just can't stop. One more example. He pictures a woman who gives into constant grumbling. And then one person observes and says this, she isn't wicked, She's only a silly, garrulous old woman who's gotten into the habit of grumbling and feels that a little kindness and rest and change would do her all right. And then here's another's response. Well, that is what she once was, right? A grumbler. That, may be, that is maybe what she still is. If so, she certainly will be cured. But the whole question is whether she is now a grumbler. The first said, I should have thought there was no doubt about that. The wise one responds, yes, but you misunderstood me. The question is whether she is a grumbler or only a grumble. And he explains what happens then if you trace this trajectory out forever. This person loses herself in her self-centered grumbling. And he says this, you'll have had experiences. It begins with a grumbling mood and yourself still distinct from it, perhaps criticizing it. And yourself in a dark hour may will that mood embracing it. You can repent and come out of it again, but there may come a day when you can do that no longer. Then there will be no you left to criticize the mood, nor even to enjoy it, but just the grumble itself going on forever like a machine. When Jesus calls us to deny ourselves and follow him, he is inviting us into joy, not out of it. He is calling us away from a self-centeredness that has a trajectory that will ultimately consume us. He's inviting us to find joy by following Him. And as we do that, we become more, not less, of our truest self. And ultimately, there's a judgment coming, which is His point here, that will decide our fate. Jesus says, you'll either be ashamed of Him now and cling to yourself, or you will deny yourself, follow Him, and then gain him and real life forever. 
So the counterintuitive invitation of Jesus is this. You do not find your life by seeking it in yourself. You find yourself by seeking Christ. Then you won't become a grumble. You'll become like Jesus. And he lived the most morally beautiful and fulfilled life anyone's ever lived. All right, a few things for us to consider as we wrap this up and work this into our lives. I think four notes of response. First, this is open to anyone. Everyone can do this. There is something universal about this call. Jesus says, if anyone comes after me. I remember the first time I heard a sermon on this text. It was from my friend Dave Newton. He and I had preached occasionally at a a convalescence home nearby where I used to live. And it was the very first time that I was going there. So I was observing him to just find out how he led the time together. And he preached this text. And I remember how striking that was. Because here was a group in that room of elderly men and women who were losing their grip on life. Some of them couldn't even walk. And yet Dave encouraged them to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Jesus. They can't walk, but they can follow Jesus. They couldn't run, but they could still renounce their selfishness and serve others. They could love and bless and encourage others even right there where they lived. And so that at first struck me as surprising. This text, Dave, um, don't they need something a little more encouraging and comforting? But then I realized how empowering this is for them because it means that no matter what kind of life, we have right now. No matter what situation you're in, you may find yourself living in a convalescence home or you may be years away from death and you still can follow Jesus and love others with this radical commitment. So you may be in high school, you may be middle-aged, you may be far older. Jesus is inviting everyone to come after him like this. Second, You have to understand yourself in order to deny yourself. You need to know yourself. You and I need to know our desires. Otherwise, we'll treat this as just this generic thing that we think we're doing without even considering if we are. Yes, I deny myself and follow Jesus. Well, what are you you actually denying? Myself. What does that mean? I don't know. I'm following Jesus. Like, specifically, what are you killing in your selfishness? Uh, Stuff, right? So, you need to think. Every one of us has to do this. So, Even take time this afternoon, this week, and think about yourself. What are the desires that drive you? In what way does your self, with a capital S, rule your life instead of Jesus? What kind of desires do you have that you can see then and to know to kill them? So what are your most prominent self-centered tendencies? What's the sin that you keep going back to that can even become comfortable to you? You have to identify that in order to renounce it. So take time to know yourself. Third, look at the culture through this lens. Jesus is giving us a lens through which to understand our culture. So pay attention how this desire for self-fulfillment, self-expression is driving people. It's saturating our movies and the music and political policy, certainly with the sexual revolution and gender identity right now. Students, listen to how this is expressed in your friends and classmates. Listen to the language of self-expression and self-discovery and self-focus. Notice how the heroes in our culture are those who follow their hearts, even if it ends up damaging relationships that are often downplayed so that the lie isn't exposed. Fourth and last, this is for everyday life. Jesus said, take up your cross daily. Did you see that? So this is not merely an initial call for how to begin following Jesus, how to become a Christian. He's saying this is for Christians every single day. The Christian life is a daily reality of renouncing yourself, picking up your cross, and following Jesus. So I want to share one practical way to have this just at least on your mind every day and seeking to begin doing this. One practical thing, it would simply be this. Ask Jesus to help you do this every day. So I want to share with you a daily prayer to pray every morning. Um, This was handed out as you came in. I'll include a PDF uh, in our midweek as well, and we'll have it out um, at the Resource Center 
next Sunday as well. If you didn't get a copy, you want another one. So this is slightly modified from John Stott. So John Stott um, prayed this every day, and I've done it most mornings for the past few years. So I encourage you to consider joining me in this as well. It's a brief daily Trinitarian prayer. So it addresses the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in that first part, praising and honoring the, the triune God. And then the second part of that prayer, there's a request made that is fitting for each person of the Trinity. And the one for Jesus goes like this, Lord Jesus, I pray that this day, right, you hear that daily from Jesus, I pray that this day I would take up my cross and follow you. So as you pray this prayer every day, you're asking Jesus to help you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. And and as you pray this, you can, of course, not just stay strictly to the lines of this prayer, but let each line be a starting point that you can elaborate on in any way you need to. So here's how the whole prayer goes. Let's just um, read this together, uh, praying it if you'd like, and then I have one final quote to share, and and then we'll pray. Good morning, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, and Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, let's do it out loud. Great. (laughs) Heavenly Father, I worship you as the creator and sustainer of the universe. Lord Jesus, I worship you, Savior and Lord of the world. Holy Spirit, I worship you, sanctifier and comforter of the people of God. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I pray that I may live this day in your presence and please you more and more. Lord Jesus, I pray that this day I may take up my cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you would fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, three persons in one God, have mercy on me. Amen. So I invite you to pray that each morning along with me. Let's end with how C.S. Lewis ended a different book of his, Mere Christianity, that gets to the heart of this. The very first step is to try to forget about the self altogether. Your real new self which is Christ's and also yours, and yours just because it was his, will not come as long as you are looking for it. It will come when you are looking for him. Look for yourself, and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find him, and with him, everything else thrown in. Just give a few moments for us to pray quietly and you just respond in whatever way you want to before the Lord. Our Father, we praise you as the creator and sustainer of all things in every breath we've taken this morning. Lord Jesus, we praise you as the Savior and Lord of the world and of our own lives, and we submit ourselves to you for your glory and for our greatest joy. And Holy Spirit, we praise you as the one who sanctifies us and transforms us and comforts us. And so, Father, Son, and Spirit, we honor you and we pray that you would help us from the deepest part of our desires to follow Jesus. Amen.